So hello and welcome everyone to today's Australian Law Reform Commission webinar, From Ideas to Action, What Interim Report C Means for You. Uh, we thank you for your interest and participation. Uh, I'm Justice Craig Colvin. I'm a part-time commissioner of the Law Reform Commission. And joining me for today's webinar, and you'll meet them in a moment, are my colleagues at the Commission, uh, Chris Ash, Ali Filken, and Nicholas Samoas de Silva. Uh, may I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and wherever you may be joining us from around Australia. Uh, I join the webinar from Buraloo, Perth, next to the Durbal Yerrigan, the place of the Wajak people of the Noongar Bujak. I acknowledge their continuing culture and would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. The purpose of today's webinar, of course, is to discuss Interim Report C. It's the last of three interim reports in the Commission's inquiry into the legislative framework for the Corporations and Financial Services Regulation. Uh, we have been building to this one, uh, and as you may be aware, uh, Interim Report A focused on the use and importance of definitions within the structure of the legislation. Uh, Interim Report Report B focused on the coherence of the overall regulatory design and hierarchy of laws. And now uh, Interim Report C focuses on how Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act might be reframed or restructured to achieve a legislative framework financial services that is clearer, more coherent and more effective. Uh, I'd like to point out that all of the ALRC's publications relating to the inquiry, including the interim reports, background papers, and recordings of previous webinars and podcasts can be accessed at the ALRC website, which I would encourage you to visit. Uh, we're keen to receive your feedback on the issues raised by Interim Report C, whether through formal submissions in response to Interim Report C or through consultations. Uh, the interim report represents the final opportunity for submissions before the final report on the inquiry, which is due to be published in November this year. Uh, the closing dates for formal submissions is the 26th of July, 2023. Uh, I would like uh, to thank everyone who has contributed to the work to date. Your contributions are greatly appreciated. They're essential, in fact, for developing meaningful and practical reforms. So let me give you a brief outline of interim report C before inviting my colleagues to speak. Uh, as with earlier reports, it makes various recommendations and puts forward uh, a number of proposals and questions uh, for engagement. A key feature of the report, though, is the proposal that most of Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act be restructured and reframed in a schedule to the Act, uh, which may be known as the Financial Services Law. This schedule would also incorporate the consumer protections uh, uh, that relate to financial services that are currently in Part 2 Division 2 of the ASIC Act. Uh, Ellie will explain this in a little more detail. Both Ellie and Nicholas will ex also explain how the ALRC's proposals for improving the structure and framing of Chapter 7 would be implemented independently if that was chosen of a new schedule to the Corporations Act. Uh, interim Report C also identifies a number of principles that it's thought should guide the structure and framing of the legislation. These principles are generally accepted in the literature and amongst professional drafters but exactly what they mean for everyday users in a particular context, that is those who are affected by the rules, is not often discussed. From the personal perspective of someone who has to uh, struggle with interpreting legislation on an almost daily basis, structure and framing of legislation are crucial. And this is because the rules of statutory interpretation require that when interpreting the text of a statute, a person must have regard to its context and purpose. If the structure and framing do not help to expose with clarity 
that context and purpose, then the task of statutory interpretation is made very difficult. The formal way in which lawmakers communicate their intentions to those in, who must interpret the law breaks down if the structure and framing isn't working well. Chris will discuss in further detail why the structure and framing of legislation matters not just for judges, but commercially as part of everyday business practice. Uh, Interim Report C also contains a chapter dedicated to implementing the proposed reforms. This deals with practical issues for implementation and their potential benefits. Uh, Nicholas will discuss these aspects and the ALRC's roadmap for implementing key reforms arising out of the inquiry. In particular, he will explain the proposal to establish a dedicated task force or task forces to oversee its implementation. As I mentioned earlier, Interim Report C represents the last opportunity to make submissions before the final, re uh, final report and we therefore encourage feedback on the approaches to implementation that are discussed in Interim Report C. The report also contains four recommendations that formalise proposals from Interim Report B. These relate to making offence and civil penalty provisions easier to identify and the consequences for their breach easier to understand. So with that introduction, I'll now invite my colleagues to discuss three of the key themes arising out of Interim Report C and uh, to join me after that for a Q&A session if anybody has questions or comments to make for the purposes of the Q&A, then please email your questions to financial.services at alrc.gov.au. That's financial.services at alrc.gov.au. So thanks to you who uh, have submitted questions in advance. We'll try to cover as much as we can, and we'll certainly take note of all of the questions as we progress the final report. But now it's time to turn to our first topic, uh, and I'll ask Chris to speak to the issue of the importance of structure and framing of legislation and what we mean by those terms. So, uh, Chris, can you tell us why structure and framing matters for anyone who may come within the operation of the legislation? Thanks very much, Judge. Um, they are very technical things and there's, there's no perfect analogy, but one, one useful way that um, I at least find useful to, to think about it is to see structure and framing a, a little bit as being like a sporting field. So let's take a, a football pitch, for example, with the FIFA Women's World Cup starting next week. Um, if ordinarily you might see one that looks like this picture with the lines all straight, the fields level and smooth, then the game will be played and almost no one, no one will notice the field. But if the ground is rough or uneven um, and the lines aren't drawn straight, then you'll probably notice it. Furthermore, that the gameplay will probably be affected and possibly even the outcome if the ball takes a bounce here or there off, off the rough patches. So the same goes for the structure and framing of legislation. No one really notices them until they make life harder than it needs to be. And so this is how a focus on structure and framing in this third interim report fits within the inquiry as a whole. Uh, because the inquiry is, is really about identifying and, where possible, trying to minimise these sources of unnecessary complexity so as to make the legislation as easy to navigate and understand as possible. So before I go much further, I should explain what we mean by the concepts of structure and framing. So both relate to how legislation is designed or crafted and how information is organised and presented. Structure is mostly about the order in which things appear uh, as well as other aspects of presentation, like white space and indentation. So relevant questions for structure are things like whether all materials should go in one act or be spread across two acts, and then how that mater material should be distributed across parts, chapters or sections, etc. Framing is a broad concept, which includes structure, but also all the other contexts that helps to shape a communication. So in, in legislation, this means headings, simplified outlines and notes. Now, this still sounds quite abstract, so 
Hopefully, a couple of examples will help to illustrate why structure and framing are important. Now, this slide has a lot of text on it, which I won't read, and I don't expect you to read either. But what it shows is um, the section of the fiction, a fictional Milk Act that we've drafted deliberately poorly so as to show the problems of poor structure and framing and to show how that can be improved. Thankfully, no actual modern legislation is quite this bad. So to step through just a few issues, firstly, there are no useful subheadings, subsections or white space. Instead, all the information appears in just one fairly uninviting block paragraph. Second, when we start looking at some of the detail, there's no intuitive order to the section. It begins with a specific power that applies to the minister, and namely the minister to make rules, which appears well before the generally applicable requirement that you need a license in order to sell milk. Even then, when that requirement is presented, an exception from the requirement for small businesses appears before it. Thirdly, the section doesn't prioritise important information. The fact that it's an offence to sell milk without a licence and that it carries a fairly hefty penalty is tucked away at the end of the section. When, in reality, this is probably the most important message that the section needs to convey. This slide now, using almost the same wording as the previous, shows the difference that structure and framing can make. Straight away, you can see that adding some white space, breaking the material up among sections and adding some indentation makes the section appear much more approachable. Instead of the offence being at the end, this version prioritises the fact that it's an offence to sell milk without a, without a licence. Secondly, the provisions that apply to sellers of milk are coherently grouped together and they aren't interrupted by the administrative detail about how to apply for a licence, which you're only likely to look at once anyway, and so is presented in a different part of the Act. Thirdly, the order makes more sense. It flows more naturally from the obligation to be licensed to the fact that you need to comply with certain rules once you're licensed before the less important information about how exactly how rules are made appears. Fourthly, there are useful headings that give a clear idea of what each section and part is about. And finally, there are some aids to interpretation that help users find their way around the legislation. So the first note, for example, shows where the procedures for applying for a licence can be found, as well as the definition of milk. And the second licence shows where the rules that must be complied with under that section can be found. Now, we, we haven't just plucked this uh, structure out of the air. Instead, we've, we've identified several principles that we've applied and that we think can be applied more generally to help structure and frame legislation. Uh, we've called them working principles because in different cases, their relative importance will differ and they may need to be traded off against each other. So the first four of the principles on this slide I've already illustrated in the Milk Act example. Grouping, appearance, prioritisation and intuitive flow. Consolidation refers to avoiding duplication and overlap. Basically, don't say the same thing twice, even if you do it in slightly different terms. Succinctness is similar in calling for brevity and clarity wherever possible. The final principle on this list, which we've labelled mental models, comes from the world of design more generally. Uh, people use mental models in their everyday lives in order to navigate and understand the world, and good design gives people clues about how to use things. So, for example, the shopping trolley icon on a website is fairly self-explanatory, and it corresponds with most people's mental model about how it is that you buy something from a website. That same logic can be applied to legislation so that the design helps users of the legislation form and use mental models of that legislation. All of these principles further what we suggest should be the objective of legislative design, namely to make legislation as easy to navigate and understand as possible. Now, of course, in the real world, there are constraints that make these principles hard to apply. Uh, so for example, while these principles are generally applied in the case of new or modern legislation, older or frequently amended legislation, like Chapter 7 of the Corporation Act, as Ellie will explain shortly, generally doesn't adhere to these principles. Uh, similarly, complex policy underpinning legislation can make it more difficult to um, apply these principles, and so too can it be made harder if there are time pressures in the design and drafting of legislation. But 
the principles and the objective are both still important, and that's for a number of reasons. First, legislation is, is generally about changing behaviours to achieve certain results. Legislation that's harder to navigate and understand will be less likely to be understood and therefore less likely to be effective in achieving its goals and those results. Secondly, legislation should is necessary to achieve the desired outcomes. If legislation is difficult to navigate and understand, then it imposes burdens of compliance that are greater than is necessary. Thirdly, the rule of law dictates that the law should be knowable and accessible. Legislation that's hard to navigate and understand goes contrary to this principle. So what does this actually mean in the real world? Like complexity more generally, poor structure and framing can create costs in several ways. Firstly, they increase compliance costs. And this is simply because it takes more time to un navigate, understand, and then attempt to follow the law. Secondly, because compliance is less likely to be achieved, the costs arising from non-compliance can increase. This can include consumer harm and litigation costs incurred by regulators in enforcing non-compliance. Finally, Poor structure and framing make it harder for people to know and enforce their rights. This is particularly important in financial services legislation, which has a strong consumer protection element to it. So I'll finish there. Hopefully that fairly quick overview um, has helped to give some idea of why the otherwise abstract world of framing and legislation uh, matters for you. Thank you and back to you, Justice Colvin. So thanks, Chris. Um, we now are going to turn to the second topic, which concerns the way in which uh, Chapter 7 of the Corporations uh, Act might be restructured and framed as publicly identified. And you'll hear from Ellie on this topic. Um, so it's uh, Ellie, uh, the, the question posed for you is, can you tell us why Chapter 7 should be restructured and reframed and what a better structure might look like. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we've used the analogy of a cupboard to help describe Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act. It's absolutely chock full of boxes and old crates and it's poorly organised. Um, it's been a long time since it's been tidied up and it now holds more than it was ever designed to. The feeling of dread that you get when approaching a uh, cupboard like that is what stakeholders have told us it's like to approach Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act. Um, largely due to historical reasons and a frequent amendment history over time, Chapter 7 doesn't adhere to the principles that Chris has described. Uh, in the interim report, we've outlined several examples of the problems uh, that face Chapter 7. However, it really boils down to three main issues. Firstly, uh, Chapter 7 really just does too much. Um, several people have told the ALRC that Chapter 7 is more like an act than an actual chapter. Um, this has been an issue since uh, Chapter 7 was introduced. However, it's really gotten worse with time. And if Chapter 7 was made its own act, it would be the 10th largest act on the statute book. The second issue is uh, it fails to prioritise the key messages. As the Financial Services Royal Commission found, there are fundamental norms in the legislation. However, they're hard to find and difficult to identify. Um, these we may clear up with better framing. The spread of consumer protections between Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act and Part 2, Division 2 of the ASIC Act is a good example of this issue. This creates overlap and reduces their communicative power when they really are fundamental norms and should be clear on the face of the legislation. Third, the structure and framing of Chapter 7 makes finding the relevant law harder than it needs to be. Users often have to wade through a lot of unrelevant provisions in order to determine which of the provisions are relevant to their situation. And there's little help in the legislation itself to help them navigate um, and find the relevant areas. The diagram to the right side of this slide shows how the provisions regulating the delivery of financial advice are spread across four different parts of the Act and dozens of disparate provisions. This lack of structures in turn generated a large amount of ASIC guidance, um, which attempts to uh, make up for the lack of framing to help users navigate the law. So, what to do? 
Much of interim report C has focused on how Chapter 7 should be repacked, uh, unpacked and repackaged uh, in order to find better homes for different parts of the law that more effectively communicates um, with users and makes it more user friendly. Several stakeholders have suggested to the ALRC that financial services should be in its own act, uh, and a lot of other jurisdictions have some form of dedicated financial services uh, act. However, for uh, historical and constitutional reasons, that's just not possible at the moment. So the ALRC has suggested in lieu of this that the financial services aspects of Chapter 7 should be moved into um, its own schedule as well as incorporated with Part 2, Division 2 of the ASIC Act. This in turn could be known as the Financial Services Law or FSL uh, schedule for short. There will be several benefits to this. Uh, primarily, it would create a clear home for financial services law, which would give it a better sense of legislative identity. Experience with the Australian consumer law is a good comparison here, uh, and experience has suggested that this, uh, this structure and title has improved public awareness among consumers. Using a schedule also provides the greatest flexibility in applying the principles Chris described earlier, and it also gives us more real estate to uh, create new provisions and new numbering systems. Under this approach, the parts of Chapter 7 that more closely relate to financial markets would remain in Chapter 7. It's possible that they would also benefit from uh, review and restructure in accordance with the principles Chris uh, mentioned earlier. So these could be done at the same time or as part of a later future reform project. Interim Report C has a lot more detail about what the FSL schedule could look like, including an illustrative outline and um, what I'll do now is briefly step through the main aspects of this chapter level overview of the FSL schedule. Each chapter in the FSL schedule will be focused on a particular theme of regulation. The first theme would be generally applicable consumer protection provisions. This uh, outline here is what that chapter would look like, and we think this approach has a number of benefits. Firstly, it will better prioritize important obligations like the fundamental obligations not to mislead or deceive and these general obligations would help frame later more specific obligations. These core standards of commercial behaviour apply to financial um, providers and should help guide their uh, behaviour as towards consumers and therefore should be located first. Secondly, it clearly provides provisions by theme and application. Uh, these provisions have the broader scope as they apply to anyone providing financial services and they apply the ASIC De Act definition of financial product and financial services. Currently, these uh, provisions are spread across the ASIC Act and different parts of Chapter 7. So grouping them would also provide a clearer policy platform uh, for future consumer protection provisions as they develop. Finally, the first as the first substantive chapter uh, the F of the FSL schedule, it's low Location would emphasize consumer protection as a fundamental policy that, underli that underlies uh, financial services legislation. The second chapter theme will be disclosure. Creating a single chapter relating to disclosure will make it much easier to find and navigate the relevant law, and it would also provide an opportunity for consolidation where there is currently duplication between different sources. As Nicholas will touch on, disclosure provisions are among the most complicated in the Act and therefore those that would benefit the greatest from uh, reform. Third, we've suggested that there should be a chapter dedicated to financial advice. Compared to the diagram I showed you earlier, this uh, outline would be much easier to navigate and it would be, include provisions that only uh, apply to the provision of financial advice. It would also better reflect the existence of a tailored regulatory regime uh, for financial advisors, which treats it as a different profession to other financial services. The final theme is that of general regulatory obligations, which we suggest should be split across two different chapters. This approach more clearly communicates the scope of different provisions. So while Chapter 2 uh, of the uh, proposed schedule would apply to a broader range of products and services by applying the definition currently in the ASIC Act, um, Chapter 3 would apply to a narrow range of um, by applying the definition in Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act. It is also shows how more important obligations could be given priority of place over those that were less important or administrative and procedural. 
which these could be, instead of being provided in Chapter 3, it would be uh, placed in Chapter 6. And signposts could be placed in Chapter 3 to alert users of legislation that there are relevant provisions located later in Chapter 6. Of course, the ALRC is conscious that creating the financial services law would be a lot of work and could be disruptive. Nicholas will discuss in more detail how this could be managed. Uh, but even if the ideas to create a financial services law in a schedule uh, weren't embraced, each of the chapters that have been discussed today could instead be implemented within the body of the Corporations Act, either by creating new chapters or as parts within a chapter. Regardless of how they might be implemented, the ALRC's proposals would produce legislation that is easier to navigate and understand, and which provides a better framework for policy developments into the future. Thanks, Ali. Um, slight delay while um, old judge works out which button to push there, I'm afraid. So, uh, Nicholas, uh, our final topic will be addressed by Nicholas and deals with uh, implementation of the uh, proposed reforms, as uh, Ellie has foreshadowed. Uh, throughout the inquiry, we've been asking stakeholders how reforms might be implemented and how transition costs can be managed. Uh, so the question for Nicholas is, can you tell us about the proposed roadmap for implementing reform and how the reforms could help reduce the costs that arise from the existing complexity of the law? Thank you, Judge. Yes, I think it's fair to say that implementation has been of keen interest to all stakeholders. And I think the main message we've heard from stakeholders is a real interest in understanding not only excuse me, how reforms can be implemented so as to maximise their benefits, but also so as to minimise and manage any with reform. So just turning then to the core package of reforms that the ALRC has put forward. These are, Ellie has talked about two of these. So the first is the reformed legislative model, which was the subject of interim report B, and that covers a decluttered act combined with a scoping order and rules that would contain, the scoping order would contain exemptions and exclusions, and rules would contain prescriptive detail appropriate for delegated legislation. The Act would focus on the key regulatory obligations and fundamental norms and be restructured in accordance with the second limb of the package of reforms proposed by the ALRC, Act would be restructured and reframed so as to make the law easier to find, to understand and navigate, and therefore to understand your core obligations uh, and the penalties that might be associated with them. The final uh, of the reforms proposed by the ALRC, Ellie has also spoken about the financial services law. These are the three main proposals so far made by the ALRC and which will be the subject of the final report, but there are other proposals as well in relation to definitions, for instance, that will also be discussed in that final report. But just to revisit what Chris discussed earlier, why do we think implementation matters? And for the, we've, as Chris flagged, identified really three main reasons. And these are that unnecessarily complex legislation makes compliance harder and more costly. It makes compliance less likely, and it makes it harder for consumers and investors to understand and exercise their legal entitlements. So just looking at that first point, in interim report C, we, we gathered some data together to kind of try and quantify the compliance costs associated with the existing legislative framework. So we gave it a little taste of it, and even looking at the small data that we had, it gave the sense that there were billions of dollars being spent on an increasingly complex and, in some cases, is incoherent legislative framework for corporations and financial services. And those costs were growing rapidly in the data that we were looking at. The costs were growing uh, incredibly quickly. The second main issue why we think implementation is so critical is that uh, uh, unnecessarily complex legislation makes compliance less likely and com supervision of compliance more complex as well. The evidence for that, again, billions of dollars paid out over the last five years in compensation programs and civil penalties by major financial services uh, institutions. 
So we think improvements to the legislative framework have the potential to unlock compliance costs, to potentially enhance compliance and unlock tens of millions of dollars in savings in terms of not only compliance costs, but also reduced consumer harm, reduced regulatory expenditure, for instance. Again, the final reason is the impact that legislative complexity has on consumers and investors, given the existence of institutions like the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. The legislation is something that consumers do have to engage with, investors do have to engage with, as they seek to access these external dispute resolution or internal dispute resolution mechanisms. Reducing legislative complexity would therefore benefit those investors and consumers, in addition to regulators, to businesses and other regulated entities. So just turning then to the package of reforms, as Chris flagged at the beginning, some of these could be implemented independently of one another, but we nonetheless have proposed them as a package. We think they work together to address the sources of complexity in corporations and financial services legislation. So for instance, the legislative model would reduce the prescriptiveness in the in Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, for instance, focusing it on the core norms and obligations while delegated legislation dealt with some of the more prescriptive detail. The Act would then be restructured and reframed, you know, now that it's less prescriptive, for instance, so that it better communicates the core obligations and norms that apply to people and makes it easier to find what provisions apply to which persons, for instance. So just while they can be implemented independently of others, we are suggest of each other, we're suggesting that these comprise a reform package. And that's how we've thought about how you would implement some of the uh, this package of reforms. So then just looking at how we would undertake uh, implementation, how we suggest it could be undertaken. So we talk about a reform roadmap, and we've suggested that it comprises six reform pillars. And the first five of these cover all of the financial services related provisions of Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act and Part 2, Division 2 of the ASIC Act, so consumer protection, disclosure, financial advice, as well as licensing and other regulatory obligations. The sixth pillar is focused on recognizing the possibility of future policy development. So this is something a number of stakeholders have raised with us, the concerns that if government were to continue developing new policy initiatives, that that might disrupt or render impossible implementation of the ALRC's proposals. So what we've suggested in interim report C is that, in fact, uh, new policy initiatives will offer a vehicle, a platform for implementing some of the ALRC's proposals. Financial advice is a potentially obvious example of this. If government were to commit to uh, substantive policy changes, the legislative amendments needed to implement those policy changes could also be used to undertake some of the reforms proposed by the ALRC, such as the creation of a new financial advice chapter, for instance, and consideration being given to reallocating material between primary and delegated legislation. So we think new policy initiatives are not an obstacle to the reforms, but in fact offer a vehicle for implementing them over time and for combining them with other government priorities, for instance. So just very briefly as well, the ALRC has suggested that implementation of these pillar pillars should occur in a staged manner. So we haven't suggested a big bang where you undertake the amendments for each of the pillars but commence them at a single point in time. We've suggested that you as one at a time perhaps leaving sufficient room for consultation and for transition periods before their commencement. And so this allows governments not only to, they can choose which of the pillars they wish to pursue and not commit to all of them, for instance, a point I'll return to in a moment. So then very quickly as well, just to flag the conceptual framework that the ALRC put forward in interim report C. I won't go into much detail about this, but in, the, in that interim report, we laid out how we think different types of provisions could be approached for the purposes of reform. So for instance, we identified significant provisions being consumer protections, for example. And these are provisions that make relatively little use of delegated legislation and where reform would mostly be a matter of amending provisions of the Act and moving that around, uh, reframing and restructuring it so that they're better communicated and easier to find and understand. 
Complex provisions are those that make extensive use of delegated legislation and a lot of prescription in the Act as well. So this is really disclosure is the most notable example among the most complex in the Corporations Act with a huge number of ASIC legislative instruments, regulations and highly prescriptive provisions in uh, parts 7.7 .7 and 7.9 of the Corporations Act. I won't touch on policy involving provisions having already discussed them, but minimal amendment provisions are just useful to flag because although we've spent three years uh, criticizing the Corporations Act, there are nonetheless a number of provisions throughout Chapter 7 that require only relatively minimal amendment to bring them into a reformed legislative framework. So licensing provisions, for instance, and those relating to the, the core obligations of financial services licensees. In Interim Report C, we suggested some restructuring of those provisions, but nothing that would radically change the way they're expressed or their content, for instance. So there's a lot of minor minimal amendment provisions that could be addressed as part of the implementation process. Just looking then at what we've learned from previous reforms and how that has informed the implementation roadmap that we've put forward. So in designing the pillars, we've really tried to respond to some of the challenges, but also the successes of previous uh, simplification and reform programs. So for instance, we've tried to design a set of pillars that are quite separable. You know, a single parliament government doesn't have to commit to undertaking all of the pillars simultaneously. It might only commit to one or two, for instance, in a single term of government, which then also ties into trying to create manageable reform packages. So we've tried to design the pillars in a way that means they could be implemented within a single parliament, within a single term of government, for instance. Then looking at prioritizing the reforms, we're conscious that some reform programs have not always been fully completed. And so then it's a matter of prioritizing reforms so that you get the biggest bang for your buck up front. And that's what the reform pillars try to do. So consumer protection, disclosure, financial advice. We think if you were able to reform those three key areas, you would achieve many of the benefits that the ALRC's reform package is aimed at achieving. So eliminating hundreds of ASIC legislative instruments, regulations, and a lot of prescriptive provisions from the Act, for instance. So those are the lessons that we've tried to carry forth into this implementation roadmap to make it as realistic as possible for stakeholders. Another lesson from previous reform packages is the importance of leadership and of consultation and of processes that allow for continued development of the implementation roadmap as and when problems might arise, for instance. So that's why the, we, we've proposed the creation of reform task forces or a task force. So for instance, there might be one for each pillar or there could be an overarching task force, for instance. And it would be the jobs of these task forces to develop the implementation roadmap so as to allow sufficient transition periods for businesses to uh, bring internal business systems across, for instance. And for that reason, although we've suggested that the task forces be led by Treasury, we've also proposed that they combine a range of non-government stakeholders from the private sector and elsewhere uh, among the non-government stakeholder community. So we think the task forces, alongside other proposals that the ALRC has made, such as a rules advisory committee and post-legislative scrutiny, we think these mechanisms will focus lawmaking processes on the users of the legislation, making sure that there's sufficient time for transition, making sure that the legislative development process is an inclusive one that is able to address problems as and when they arise. So really trying to build on processes as well as changes to the technical substance of the law. So finally, although the ALRC's suggested roadmap tries to minimize and manage transition costs, there nonetheless will be transition costs in moving to a simpler legislative framework. Those would be for government, for businesses, uh, and for a range of other stakeholders. But as we'll be arguing in the final report, we think those costs are worth it. Financial services legislation, we've argued, is really the invisible, often unnoticed social infrastructure that sits behind the modern financial system and the millions of transactions that occur between investors and consumers and businesses every year. And as we've heard from stakeholders in the course of this inquiry, and as we've found in our own analysis, that infrastructure is in a severe state of disrepair.
So just as building a new road takes money and causes disruption, we think that investing in financial services legis legislation so too will carry costs. It will bring disruption as well, but it will also reduce complexity, improve navigability, and create a more flexible regulatory framework. And then the ultimate outcome is a better road, more easily traveled, more easily built upon and expanded as and when needed, and with a clearer destination at the end. So Interim Report C provides a lot more detail about implementation and how we think it could occur. But we really want to hear more from stakeholders as we approach the final report. So please take the last opportunity uh, that has arisen in the, in the course of this three-year inquiry to make submissions and to let us know your feedback on this implementation model and how we, you think we could do it better uh, and how we can make implementation as effective and efficient as possible. Thank you, Judge. I'll hand back to you. Thanks so much, Nicholas. Um, so that concludes uh, the formal presentations in relation to uh, the key aspects of Interim Report C. Um, there is now an opportunity for uh, questions and they can still be uh, communicated, but I'll raise a number of them now with our, our panellists. Um, a question firstly for you, Chris. In Ali's presentation, there was a reference to um, the fact that in other places we have bilateral services acts or a single piece of legislation. So, um, why is it that we can't uh, move in that direction, Australia? Thanks, Judge. Um, the the reasons for that are largely uh, historical and and constitutional, and so. Um, Australia is, is unique in that it includes this substantial body of financial services legislation in the same act that regulates the establishment of corporations, the operation of corporations, um, insolvency and all, all manner of, of, of other things. Um, many other jurisdictions, as, as you point out, have standalone financial services legislation. So in the case of the UK, there's the Financial Services and, and Markets Act. Uh, and New Zealand adopts different approaches and has some standalone legislation as well. And so um, while there, there are good arguments for um, doing, as a lot of people have suggested, which is extracting Chapter 7 from the Corporations Act into its own act, um, it, it just wouldn't be possible under the present constitutional arrangements. And so I won't go into and bore you with all of the detail now. Um, we've got a background paper for that. Um, but basically, the, the Commonwealth's power to amend the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act largely stems from a referral of matters from the states under the Constitution. And now the terms of that referral expressly provide that the Commonwealth cannot use that power to enact other standalone legislation. It can only use it to, to make this, this convoluted defined term of express amendments um, to specific legislation, the Corporations Act, the ASIC Act, and a couple of other um, less significant acts. And so the, the consequence of that is um, that a standalone act couldn't be enacted. And it's that background that, that has, has driven, um, at least in part, our suggestion that the financial services law be placed in a schedule to the Corporations Act. And it's for similar reasons that the Australian Consumer Law appears in the schedule to the Competition and Consumer Act. Um, one other point it's, it's, it's worth noting in that in terms of we, we haven't suggested just simply extracting the entirety of Chapter 7. What we've suggested instead is that you could, you could create a, a more coherent body of financial services law if you took the financial services related aspects and grouped them together separately from the um, markets related aspects. Because I think as, as Ellie touched on, while, while it makes sense at a high level to include markets and financial services together in Chapter 7, uh, the result is that it, it simply does too much. And so we think you can get a, a more co coherent, um, clearer legislative framework if you take a different approach to those. And that's the, that's the opportunity that um, this inquiry offers, I think. Yes, thanks for that. It, it provides an explanation, really context for why we're uh, suggesting that a significant form of reform finds its place in a schedule to a piece of legislation 
it's really a mechanism by which it can be given an appropriate separate identity uh, to carry into effect a lot of the proposals that have been uh, recommended. Um, so uh, another question in relation to um, how long this might take um, if uh, the, the recommendations are accepted. A question for you, uh, Nicholas, in relation to that process um, and whether there's a risk that it could uh, be started and not finished or only get half halfway completed. Yes, I, I think it's a very important question and one we've been conscious of looking at previous reform efforts, uh, particularly in relation to income tax. So or incomplete simplification projects are a risk. So what the, the main way we've sought to address that are first to create a sense of momentum. And so that's things like the task force, uh, making sure the evidence of harm, of the problems in the existing legislative framework are clear. So trying to first create a sense of momentum, but then designing an implementation roadmap that then takes the benefits as quickly as possible. So consumer protection, disclosure, and financial advice, as we've said, we think if you can reform just those three areas, which we've prioritized as the first three reform pillars, that that is where you can really win a lot of the, the big benefits here. And so in that sense, to perhaps torture another metaphor, we're, we're not really picking low-hanging fruit. We're trying to pick the ripest fruit, so the areas of the law that are most ready for reform, where the benefits would be greatest, and try and pick those as quickly as possible and get them done as quickly as possible. And in that sense, you know, Parliament doesn't have to pick the whole tree, for instance, but we do have to start somewhere. And, and with the reform pillars we've proposed, we've started trying to, where well, we said that that is where you can pick the, the biggest benefits first and as quickly as possible. So I think it's both trying to create that sense of momentum and hopefully maintain it, and then trying to seize the benefits as quickly as possible of any reforms to the legislative framework. Uh, yes, I mean, maybe there's even another metaphor, a kind of town planning metaphor, where you, there's an overall design of the way all of this is going to look. Uh, you don't have to build the whole city in one go, um, and, but by designing the way in which it will happen, you'll know that each element has its reform will fit in with the other elements in the same sort of sort of way. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's I and mean, it is an important aspect of what's being done, but it's not it's not, I think, as you mentioned earlier, a big bang kind of approach. Uh, this this will have built the idea is it has built into it structures to be able to implement this over time. Um, so um, uh, another question then, Ellie, if, if, we, if we do this, how do we know that what has happened uh, through continuous reform where you've ended up with this complexity and incoherence, why won't we just get that coming back again? That's a really important question. Uh, and I think it's, it's our belief that uh, the best approach to that issue is post-enactment review. In the past, there's really um, been a bit of a set and forget attitude when an act has been brought into force. Uh, however, modern legislation uh, is increasingly including requirements uh, for post-enactment review to take place, which effectively means going back and scrutinising what effect an act has had and whether it is meeting its objectives or needs to be reassessed. Uh, this is often called post-enactment review or post-legislative scrutiny, which uh, is a distinction that we've discussed in a background paper. Um, so it's a proposal in interim report C that uh, the financial services legislation include a provision requiring periodic review by an independent reviewer um, to ensure that it is meeting those key goals, that complexity is being reduced and that those expenses associated with the um, implementation effort uh, do eventually uh, go down and that this uh, overall legislative scheme is improved. Um, so one uh, useful benchmark for this would be uh, notional amendments. We know from previous interim reports that these pose a very significant issue for stakeholders and make the law quite inaccessible. Uh, there's currently about 1,200 of them on the statute book. So uh, if after a certain period of time we are able to assess that 
they are no longer part of the legislative scheme and they have been either uh, discontinued or incorporated into the legislation, that will be a tangible benefit that we'll be able to record. And that's just one example. Thanks, Hallie. Um, I think there's been two references to the background of different background papers. Um, part of uh, what has occurred during this inquiry has been some substantial work done in particular areas to produce some excellent background papers. They're available, another plug to access the website on these on these topics and pick up uh, on those. Um, so uh, picking up again on this restructuring and uh, reframing process and how it can be undertaken, um, whether it requires new legislation or whether it, it can be uh, applied to old legislation in a particular ways. Um, so I think a question for you, Nicholas, about whether whether that this what is being conceived of requires completely starting afresh. Mm. I think although this corp this inquiry has been focused really on corporations and financial services legislation, over the course of the three interim reports, we have also had to step back and have a broader look at how legislation is designed and drafted in Australia and internationally. And, and in that way, we're not proposing anything radical or that requires ripping up existing approaches. What we've really tried to do is understand existing best practice, synthesize it, and really distill it into principles that can be applied. And for that reason, it, it isn't a matter then of going into the statute book and you know cutting things up and rewriting things willy-nilly. It really can be quite targeted reforms to certain areas as well of existing legislation, as well as uh, these principles then being used to inform new legislative initiatives. And so just in that first way, Treasury is already undertaking a number of reform programs that in a way implement some of the principles identified in this inquiry. So for instance, the Treasury Laws Improvement Program will be doing things like creating a single glossary for the Corporations Act. And that builds on principles like having a mental model of the legislation so you know where to go to find definitions and to be grouping provisions and uh, structuring them intuitively for readers. Again, also, they have a Treasury has a, a rationalizing ASIC instruments measure. And so the idea there is to bring together some of the proliferating instruments that are out there and consolidate them, which is another of the principles that the ALRC has put forward, and to group provisions so that they can most easily be found besides one another. So taking six ASIC instruments, for instance, and consolidating them and grouping them together so that it's easier for stakeholders to find the provisions that apply to them and then to under read and understand those provisions. So already, I think these principles that we've distilled are helping to inform uh, or are already being reflected in existing reform programs. Just also, the principles are, are designed so that they can be applied no matter how big or small a legislative measure is. So whether you're uh, amending or creating a new section or part or division, for instance, these principles can inform those reforms. So it doesn't require a whole new act in which to uh, implement these principles. If, for example, you're creating a new part, you can think about, or drafters and designers can think about how to structure that so that it prioritizes important provisions for the reader, so that provisions are grouped as effectively as possible and mental models are fostered. I, I think just in terms of making sure we don't rip up the statute book or anything like that, which I don't think is a risk, but OPC, the Office of Parliamentary Counsel, and policy instructors have a lot of experience in the sense of choosing when to uh, rewrite a part of the statute book to bring it into best practice. So, you know, there's already this build up, build uh, large experience in terms of that issue. I think what we've done that's been quite helpful is in distilling these principles, we've given other stakeholders a set of tools by which they can look at new or amended legislation and say, well, is this doing, is this implementing these principles as effectively as possible? I think we're Try, we're trying to help foster a dialogue not only within government about how to build better legislation, but between government and other stakeholders who can bring uh, these, these perspectives and say, well, are you building a mental model as effectively as possible, or are you grouping financial advice provisions as helpfully as you can? So trying to foster that dialogue 
between drafters and designers and the users of legislation on the other side. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I think a final question, and you forgive me, uh, Dorothy Dix's question for you, uh, Chris. So what's left for the ALRC in the final report now we've been through the three interim reports? Well, yes, having having written three interim reports, I'd like to think that the final report would just run itself now. Um, but there is some further work to do. We will obviously reflect further on um, stakeholder views and submissions that we've received today in order to think about what proposals we convert into recommendations. Um, we'll obviously also reflect on the submissions in response to interim report C that we've outlined today. And um, I, we're also planning, I think as Nicholas has touched on, on saying um, more about implementation in the final report, which, which again, hopefully um, some feedback will help us to develop that discussion. Uh, and we'll also touch upon some of the alternatives that have been uh, suggested to us throughout the inquiry. Uh, so hopefully there, there will be um, a little bit of new material there for, for you to look forward to. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you, uh, Chris, Ellie and Nicholas for the excellent presentations. Um, it's almost time to bring the uh, presentation to an end. Um, can I can I say before doing that that of course um, these reports are proposed in this interim way in order to facilitate uh, consultation and submissions, um, and we invite and encourage them, short or long. Um, whether they're focused on a particular aspect or whether they're engaging comprehensively with what is being addressed in interim report C. Uh, the date for close of submissions again is the 26th of July, uh, 2023. Um, and this is the sort of end of the process of submissions before the final report is formulated. So I encourage you to take up uh, that final opportunity to address them, particularly the, the practical issues uh, as to the way that are thrown up by uh, what has been proposed up until this particular uh, point in time. The submissions are best made through the website. If they can, we can receive them physically, but they're best made in that manner um, uh, or by sending an email to financial services at alrc.gov.au. So I thank you all for your attendance and for your interest. Uh, and uh, we look forward to receiving your submissions or engagement in the ongoing consultation process. Uh, thank you very much.